My name is David Powell, but my wife, family, and friends call me Dav. My boss, however, prefers the more formal David. Despite this, we have a good working relationship, and I enjoy my job. I work as a lawyer for a company specializing in management, consulting, and accounting, focusing on corporate law. I put in long hours at work, but have the flexibility to adjust my schedule when needed. Meeting deadlines is a priority for me, ensuring my boss has no issues with my performance. My wife, Carol, works for a publishing company, primarily editing from home. Her flexible hours allow her to take care of our three children. We have two daughters, aged seven and five, and a four-year-old son. Our family life is busy, filled with various activities and trying to have fun along the way. As a couple, we aim to go out together at least twice a month. Though we don't always manage it, we make an effort. Until recently, I believed Carol was happy with our life. Despite my 60-hour work weeks, I thought she was content and that we had a strong relationship. I tried to show my love and appreciation through small gestures. However, about a year ago during one of our date nights, Carol initiated a conversation that changed the course of our relationship and marriage. Honey, do you ever feel like we're missing out on things? Carol asked. Gosh, I'm not sure. What things are you thinking about? I replied. She sighed. Lately, it feels like we're stuck in a routine. I'm not sure if you see it too, dear. What does that routine look like to you? I inquired. It seems like all we do is work and take care of the kids. We hardly have any time for ourselves, she explained. I thought about her words, guessing where she might be heading. Would you like to go on a vacation, just the two of us? We could ask your parents to watch the kids for a week and go to the Caribbean for some sun and beach. We could both use some relaxation. Carol surprised me with her response. That sounds nice, honey, but I had something else in mind to shake things up a bit. Now curious, I asked, what exactly are you thinking, dear? She hesitated, then began. You know how we've talked about pretending to pick up others and having closeness with them. What if we actually tried it? My heart raced. What are you suggesting? Just hear me out for a minute, she urged. What if we explored the idea of having an open marriage? We could take it slow and see if it works for us before making any big decisions. Caught off guard, I confessed. This is surprising. I don't know what to say. Carol persisted. Think about it. What if we found other people who were compatible with us to have closeness with occasionally, without any romantic commitments? Imagine the passion and excitement we could bring back into our marriage and to each other. I realized I was holding my breath. Then I said, what exactly are you proposing, Carol? You want to be intimate with another man. She smiled and explained, it wouldn't be cheating, dear. It'd be casual, with no romance, no relationship like ours. Just occasionally, maybe a few times a month. That's it. What do you think? Stunned, I asked again, let me make sure I understand. You want to have sex with other men a couple of times a month. Well, it doesn't have to be exactly twice a month. It could be more or less, depending on what we decide, she responded. I couldn't have been more shocked if she had hit me with a hammer. I pondered for a moment. We both get to be involved in this. Yes, of course, we both get to share in the excitement. Just imagine the new things we could discover about pleasuring each other that we haven't explored yet. Think about the rekindled passion we could experience, Carol explained. I let out a breath. But how would we even start? Do you already have someone in mind? If I agree, because right now I'm not on board. Carol urged, take a moment to consider it. We could enjoy intimacy without any obligations. It would be at times that don't disrupt our schedules or family life, and we'd still be there for each other, just like before. Our family wouldn't be impacted, and our personal lives might even improve. Together, we'd experience a boost in passion and connection. Deep down, I sensed something was off. Caramel always plans everything carefully. This situation was no exception. I suspected she had spent a lot of time imagining this scenario and might even have someone specific in mind to be intimate with if I agreed. So just to clarify once more, 
You're saying we can both seek other partners outside of our marriage. You won't feel jealous, upset, or hurt if I'm with another woman, and you expect me to be okay if you're with another man. Is that what you're proposing? I questioned. Well, yeah, that's pretty much it. What do you think? Should we give it a shot? She asked eagerly. I needed to get to the heart of the matter. Who was this guy she wanted to be intimate with? If I agree to this wild idea, when do you want to start? And who's the person you have in mind? I inquired. Her eagerness to have me on board with her plan gave away a clue. Well, there's this guy, Paul, at the publishing company. He's been asking me to lunch whenever I'm at the office. He's younger than us, and from what others say, he's already in a relationship, she admitted. The secret was out. She was interested in some young guy named Paul. So, Paul, huh? Well, what do you think, honey? Are you up for trying something new to spice up our marriage? She asked. I still don't see how you being with another man will improve our marriage. If you want better intimacy, why not explore ways we can enhance it together, not with someone else? How does adding another man to the mix improve our connection? I just want to understand. This is about us, I explained. Imagine the fresh perspectives we could gain from each other, like hiring a consultant for new ideas, she suggested. I was taken aback. But how does bringing in another person help us? If we're having issues, shouldn't we address them together, not by involving others? She paused, considering my words. Maybe you're right. I just thought it could bring a new spark. But if it's not something you're comfortable with, we can explore other ways to improve our relationship together. Why not consider seeing a therapist together? You having an affair with some guy doesn't seem like it would benefit our relationship at all, I added. Carol struggled to let go of the idea. Honey, trust me, my suggestion is for our benefit. I never do anything to harm our marriage, she insisted. Growing frustrated with her persistence, I responded, Carol, I don't control you. I can only share my thoughts on how this might affect us and our family. Think of it as an adventure for both of us. Imagine how much we could learn and grow together, she urged. Carol, this isn't like signing up for a class. You're suggesting being intimate with another man. But grief, I muttered, rising from the table and heading to the men's room to splash cold water on my face. As I looked at myself in the mirror, I sensed she had ulterior motives and was likely determined to do as she pleased, regardless of my objections. I dried off and returned to the table, not at all convinced that Carol's plan would improve our marriage. I believed it would only add more complications to our lives. We already had plenty to deal with without introducing sexual relationships with others, even if we agreed to it beforehand. What bothered me most was that I married Carol expecting us to be exclusive to each other. That's what marriage means to me. There's an expectation of loyalty and monogamy, or at least that's what I thought. We even promised it in our wedding vows to be faithful to each other. It was clear my wife wasn't finding sexual fulfillment with me, and that saddened me. The following two weeks were tense between us. She kept smiling at me, expecting me to agree with her plan. She even intensified our usual sex routine. Instead of twice a week, she wanted sex every night for a whole week. After putting the kids to bed, she take my hand and lead me to the bedroom. We showered together, exploring each other with soapy hands. Carol was attractive and in shape, clearly desiring more intimacy than twice a week. Had I been neglecting her needs in bed? She was more eager than I'd seen her in years, wanting to try various positions we hadn't used since before having kids. Maybe we had fallen into a rut, but was having sex with others the solution? A week later, with no mention of an open marriage, I thought she had forgotten the idea. Maybe more sex was what she truly wanted. I was wrong. Carol continued initiating intimacy every night. After a particularly passionate session where she engaged me twice, she brought it up again. Honey, have you considered trying an open marriage like I suggested? Dang. Honestly, I was kind of hoping all the extra sex meant you changed your mind about the whole thing. I admitted. Well, the closeness with you lately has been awesome, but it's been pretty much the same. Every time we need to switch things up, make it more exciting. 
That's what I'm hoping we can learn from others, she explained. I felt disappointed that she still wanted an open marriage. So you still want us to be open, so you can be with other men? I said, my tone showing I wasn't happy about it. Don't be so down, David. This is a chance for us to grow individually and bring new experiences to our marriage. The passion and excitement you want, she insisted. You're not getting it with me right now, are you? This is an opportunity for both of us to explore new things to bring back to our relationship. I think it'll make us stronger as a couple. Carol, as I said before, I don't control you. You make your own choices. If this is truly what you want, then I guess you'll go ahead with it, even if I disagree. Just be cautious about what you're seeking, because every decision has consequences. Thank you, David. You'll see this will benefit both of us. With that conversation, it seemed settled. I left the room to grab a strong drink. I knew my marriage was over, and there was no point in trying to change her mind. Carol had what she wanted, free reign to be with other men. There wasn't much I could do to stop her. This situation was all messed up, but it was time for her to face the consequences. One month later, Carol wasted no time in meeting up with Paul from her workplace. They met twice a week, despite our agreement not to stay overnight with lovers. After their fourth meeting, she began texting me late, claiming she had been drinking wine and shouldn't drive. How convenient. I advised her to take a cab after putting the kids to bed. One Saturday, we sat down to discuss what had been happening over the past month. Carol, we need to clarify some things about this open marriage arrangement. We shouldn't be doing things that the other person isn't comfortable with or hasn't agreed to. Well, what specific things are you referring to? She asked. To begin with, we agreed on no overnight stays, but you spent the night with Paul four times in the past two weeks. That's not what we discussed. I want you home at night. Honestly, I worry when you're not here. You don't tell me where you're going, and that needs to change. Are you just upset about having to handle the kids' morning routine alone? No, this isn't about the kids. This is about your actions and our agreement. All right, no more overnight stays. What's next? Perhaps we should create a written agreement acknowledging our responsibilities to each other, the kids, and as a family. But David, that seems unnecessary. We're adults, we can handle this. Maybe so, but I believe communication is crucial for making this work. When you turn off your phone while with another man, it worries me. Your safety is important to me. Another concern is protection. Is your partner using protection? I'm on birth control, David, if that's what you're worried about. Carol, I'm concerned about sexually transmitted diseases. Did he provide proof from a doctor that he's STD free? I didn't ask, but I'm sure he's fine. So he's not using protection. Does he finish inside you? Carol blushed at the question. Yes, he does. If he had an STD and didn't tell you and then passed it to you, you could pass it to me if we ever have sex again. Carol fell silent, and in my mind I decided I wouldn't have sex with her again. At least not now. Carol. When you decided against a monogamous marriage, it came with responsibilities. Do you plan to stop having sex with me? It had to be said, even if it wasn't what David would say. I love you dearly. We have children, and we want to grow old together and take care of each other. I grew increasingly upset by her disregard for our well-being. I didn't know what else to say. I want to have a conversation with Paul. I told Carol. She was surprised by my request. What? Why do you want to talk to him? I want to meet him and have a chat. I want to ensure that he's prioritizing your safety and interests honestly. I explained. I wanted to confirm if Carol had been truthful with him about our agreement. I wasn't sure if she had made it clear to Paul that their relationship was purely physical, without any romantic expectations. Carol was too secretive about her activities for my liking. I suspected he might be offering things she couldn't or wouldn't give, like love. Was she in love with him? It's rare for someone to love two people equally. As feelings develop for one person, affection for another typically diminishes. That's human nature. I felt I'd already lost my wife the day she considered an open marriage. I hadn't sought out my own partner. Frankly, I wasn't interested until now. 
but seeing this new side of my wife made me think, what's good for her should be good for me too. Seven months later, all right, it's been several months since we opened our marriage. Carol now has a steady boyfriend. First, it was Paul. Now it's a guy named Gordon. About four months ago, I insisted on meeting him. Carol's opposition only strengthened my resolve to have a conversation with him about the woman he's involved with. One day, I visited the publishing company office to find him. It was a day when I knew Carol would be working from home. I arrived at the offices and the receptionist directed me to Paul's cubicle. He was there. I have to admit, I was surprised by the young man I met. He appeared to be in his mid-twenties, about my height, with brown hair and a slender build. I introduced myself, and as he stood to shake my hand, he quickly realized I was Carol's husband and withdrew his hand. I wondered what that was all about. Hello, Paul. I'm David Powell, Carol Powell's husband. We need to talk. Let's find somewhere private to have a conversation. There are important matters to discuss, I said, gesturing for him to follow me. I wasn't certain he would, but he did, albeit nervously. Perhaps he thought I was there to confront him. It seemed his perspective on his relationship with my wife differed greatly from mine. We settled in a nearby coffee shop and ordered some coffee and a croissant. I wanted him to feel at ease enough to speak openly with me. So Paul, could you tell me a bit about yourself? I asked. Paul seemed jittery, but after several inquiries, I began to unravel the truth about his understanding of his relationship with Carol and his expectations of her. Eventually, through persistent questioning, I gleaned some revealing insights into their true relationship. It appeared Carol began engaging in sexual activity with Paul roughly a month before we agreed to an open marriage. Paul consistently refrained from using protection, asserting he was free of diseases and willing to undergo testing. He relayed Carol's concerns about the state of our marriage, suggesting I lacked emotional support and she contemplated separation or divorce. Additionally, she conveyed my supposed acceptance of her involvement with other men. Paul inquired if I harbored resentment towards him and if I intended retaliation. I assured him otherwise, visibly calming him. However, I firmly instructed him to use protection with Carol going forward, with no room for negotiation. I warned of potential consequences if he disregarded this directive. Does your girlfriend know that you are having sex with Carol? I asked. What girlfriend? Carol is my girlfriend, Paul responded. Carol told me that you had a girlfriend and then having sex with her was in addition to your other relationship. My last girlfriend and I broke up months ago. Carol is my only girlfriend now, Paul clarified. This strongly indicated Carol's lack of honesty with me. She had deceived me about her connection with Paul and her expectations for their future together. It became evident that her vision for the future diverged significantly from mine. A couple of nights later, Carol was furious with me for meeting Paul. David, why did you go see Paul? He mentioned that you were angry and threatened him, she said. I smacked inwardly. Did he tell you that I insisted? Did he use protection if he wants to have sex with you? Yes, he did, but using protection ruins the fun. Why are you insisting on that? We're both STD free for God's sake, she retorted, visibly upset. Taking the mature approach, I said, honey, I'm just concerned about your safety. We agreed that you and he would use protection. You consented to that. Carol muttered something and stormed off. We didn't speak for two days, and we finally talked. She was furious once more. Are you satisfied now? Paul ended things with me. I won't see him again. That's what you really wanted right when you went to see him. What I wanted, my dear wife, was to ensure your safety. I didn't want you to risk getting a disease that could harm you or even be fatal. That's what mattered to me. I also wanted to prevent any disease from spreading to me, although it seems unnecessary, since we haven't been intimate in so long that I can't even remember the last time. What happened to the idea that this open marriage would benefit us and strengthen our relationship? When did that happen? Carol. I was angry with her and she knew it well. I hope you're satisfied now. And she stormed off, 
a coldness settling over our marriage. It was a very silent month. We hardly spoke to each other, and then everything suddenly changed. Carol announced that she was meeting a new man. She dressed up in a revealing blouse and skirt paired with high heels. Her hair and makeup were flawless, and she wore a new perfume that I hadn't noticed before. Suddenly, she was exceptionally sweet. She called me dear for the first time in a while, as she mentioned going out to meet someone. Alarm bells went off in my mind. All right, where are you going and who are you meeting? I reminded her that she was expected home tonight, emphasizing it should be tonight, not at 3 o'clock am. Things quickly spiraled out of control after that encounter. However, I did manage to learn his name, his occupation, and that he was divorced. She began by seeing Gordon once a week, but after a few months, she was nearly living with him. She only stays at home a few nights a week, sometimes just one typically when her lover is away for work. I believe he works as a sales representative for a pharmaceutical company, but Carol is secretive about him. I grew tired of her behavior and moved her belongings to the spare bedroom. She was taken aback, but I explained it would be easier if I had overnight guests, especially since I'm the one caring for the kids all the time. Her belief that having a relationship with another man would ignite passion and intensity in our marriage didn't turn out as she hoped. Instead, it brought about a lot of drama. I found myself growing increasingly frustrated with Carol. I probably should have divorced her long ago, but I didn't want our kids to experience a broken home. Plus, even if I did leave, the children would be left with a mother who wasn't there for them at night. It was a challenging period for me. I couldn't comprehend why she wanted to engage in such behavior, nor could I understand my own reasons for tolerating it. I hope that having a relationship with another man would spark more passion in our marriage didn't pan out as expected. Instead, it brought a lot of drama into our lives. I found myself increasingly frustrated with Carol. Maybe I should have ended our marriage long ago, but the thought of our kids growing up in a broken home was unbearable. Even if I did leave, they'd be left with a mother who wasn't there for them at night. It was a tough time for me trying to understand why she pursued such behavior and why I put up with it. Yes, you're suggesting that I'm not exempt from blame, and you're probably right. I was too lenient with her and her actions. I ended up taking on most of the parenting responsibilities while she was hardly ever home. It was noticeable to the kids who missed having their mother around. They asked about her almost every day, wondering why she had to be away so much. Initially, I told them she was spending time with a friend and would return soon. However, seeing her only one or two nights a week made it hard for them to believe her declarations of love. My oldest, who was nine, even asked, Dad, why does mom spend so much time with her friend who is her friend? It was difficult to explain. Carol began neglecting important responsibilities she usually handled for the kids. One afternoon, the school called to inform me that the parent-teacher interviews, which Carol typically attended, had occurred the day before without her presence. The vice principal expressed concern, as Carol is usually reliable, and offered to reschedule if there were any issues. Attempts to reach Carol by phone were unsuccessful as her phone was switched off, leading to voicemail. I apologized to the school and promised to arrange a new appointment the following day. When I tried contacting Carol, her phone went straight to voicemail. I left a distressed message questioning her absence from the meeting and urging her to call me back for three days. She didn't call and dismissed it as trivial. I wanted her to return home so we could talk. She agreed to come over that Friday afternoon. I took time off and prepared to give her an ultimatum. However, on Friday, she called to cancel, citing a potential work commitment. It seemed like she was stalling, likely due to pressure from her boyfriend. The next significant incident that drew a clear boundary was our daughter's birthday. Most parents celebrate their children's birthdays to show love and care. Kids expect presents, cake, ice cream, and friends. My children were no exception, but when your mother forgets your eighth birthday, it's hard to ignore. A few weeks earlier, I asked Carol if she would plan our daughter's birthday party. She assured me she would handle it well. However, as time passed, there was no action from her end, so I took charge, 
sending out invitations, buying a gift for my daughter, booking a venue, and arranging food. I hoped Carol would remember, but she didn't. My daughter was devastated that her mother wasn't there for her party. When other parents asked about Carol, I made up a work-related excuse. My daughter felt deeply hurt by her mother's absence. I called Carol, and when she answered, I handed the phone to my daughter. Mom, it's me. Where are you? My daughter asked. Carol hesitated for a moment. What's up, honey? Mom, today's my birthday. Why aren't you here? We had a party, but you didn't come. There was silence on the line. My daughter thought her mother had hung up and gave my phone back to me. Carol, are you still there? I heard crying. What's wrong? You missed Avis's birthday. For goodness sake. The call ended abruptly. A neighbor approached me quietly, asking if everything was okay with Carol. She hadn't seen her around lately and sensed that our relationship was strained. That evening, I reached a breaking point. Carol's disinterest in both me and our children led me to the decision to proceed with a divorce. In essence, we were already living separate lives. It was time to bring the situation to a close. The following day, I dialed Carol's number, expecting her voicemail to pick up immediately. Leaving a brief yet urgent message, I requested her to call me back promptly. Alternatively, I urged her to come over to the house for a conversation. Surprisingly, using the word urgent seemed to catch her attention, as she showed up at our house after dinner that same night, David. What's the matter? Why did you say it's urgent and important? Are the kids all right? Carol asked anxiously. Hello, Carol. I'm glad you came. Thank you. We really need to have a serious talk. Please take a seat, I replied. She glanced at her watch as I spoke. Don't worry, this won't take too long. So what's on your mind? Well, since you've been away, the kids keep asking. When you're coming back home, are you planning to return, Carol? Because it seems like you've already left us. Of course, I'll come back, David. I've mentioned before that I need this time to rediscover the passion and closeness we lost. Once I've fulfilled that need, I'll be back home. I'll be a better wife, and we'll be a family again. Sure, just so you're aware, Avis was heartbroken the other night when you didn't show up for her birthday party, and our other two kids have been wondering if you'll be there for their birthdays too. Carol's eyes widened, revealing her shock. How could you forget your own children's birthdays now? Here's the hard truth for both you and your lover, Carol. I've made up my mind. I want a divorce. What? Why are you asking for a divorce? David, I'll be back home soon. Carol, there's no marriage left here. You're not fulfilling your role as a wife. And since you've already left the house, I can't fulfill mine either. To be honest, you shouldn't have left in the first place. I stayed quiet for the sake of our kids, but this situation has gone too far. You moved out and settled things months ago, barely remembering that you have children and obligations to them, let alone to me. My lawyer says the court views this as abandonment of our marriage and our kids. But David, I love you and the kids. Can't you see that? No, Carol, I don't see any love. If you truly loved your husband, you wouldn't be having an affair. If you cared about us, why did you leave? Why did you move in with your boyfriend? Talking about bringing passion and intensity to our marriage is just a joke. I won't even bring our kids into this conversation, as your actions speak volumes about how much you care for them. The joke's on me, but I'm done laughing. We're getting divorced as soon as possible. Pack your things and go back to him. You're not my wife anymore. I'm not your husband. But David, we're married. I'm your wife. You're my husband. I love you. I didn't want a divorce. Well, I do want a divorce. I've looked into it, and the courts here recognize when someone has abandoned their marriage. You left our marriage and our kids. So, leave the house. Go back to Gordon, where you want to be. I don't want you here anymore. Carol seemed surprised by my words, gathered her purse, and quietly left. What I hadn't told Carol was that while she was with her new boyfriend, I had started looking for someone to have fun with. I found a woman named Shanna. She had two kids, 
and her husband had left her for a younger woman. I went on a date with her, and my kids were thrilled. When I got back, my daughter came down and asked about my date. Honey, it went really well. I had a great time. Shana is a very nice person. I like her a lot. Is she going to be our new mother? Wow, where did that come from? Kids these days seem to know more than I did at their age. That's not something you need to worry about, sweetie. Besides, this was only our first date. I'm not sure when there will be a second. And as for Mong, well, I'm not sure she's ever coming back. That was a tough question. I continued speaking softly. But I know one thing for sure. I'm not going anywhere. I'll always be here with you, your sister and brother. You can count on that. Thanks, Dad, she said, hugging me before we headed back to her room, where I tucked her into bed. I went to the kitchen, poured myself a glass of water, and sat at the counter to ponder. My wife had essentially left her family to be with her lover. Meanwhile, I had enjoyed a date with a lovely woman who could potentially become my new partner. Tonight had been the most enjoyable in the past year. The intimacy had been incredible, and I wanted it to continue. I desired a companion to share my life with once again. However, my mind cautioned me to take things slowly. On Monday, I reached out to my divorce lawyer to discuss moving forward with the process, having the financial figures from before. I had a good idea of what divorcing Carol would entail. It would require dipping into my retirement savings to cover her share of the house and possibly providing a modest amount of alimony for a couple of years, but at this point, it seemed like a necessary expense. It was time to move forward. She showed no interest in returning, and it was evident that she no longer prioritized her children or me. I instructed my lawyer to go ahead and deliver the papers. I have her address, and since she mostly works from home, locating her shouldn't be too difficult. Proceed with it, and let's finalize this marriage. Three days later, there was a knock at the door of the apartment where Carol and Gordon resided. The process server was adept at gaining access to apartment buildings, so when he knocked, she was the only one present. She opened the door. Carol Powell, this is for you, he stated, handing her the envelope. You've been served. Carol was taken aback by his words. She knew the contents of the envelope. She slowly shut the door and brought the envelope into the kitchen, placing it on the counter. She waited for over an hour before opening it reflecting on the past year and her choices. Were they wise decisions? Did she truly consider the consequences when she expressed her desire to have an affair? Was Gordon worth sacrificing her life and children for? Although the intimacy with him was unparalleled, was it sufficient? Was her husband David truly so dull as a partner that she felt compelled to leave him and her children? Did she despise her former life enough to exchange it for Gordon? These were challenging questions. With caution, she slid open the envelope and withdrew the papers. She handled them delicately, almost as if expecting them to erupt in her face as she reviewed them. A divorce, citing abandonment and infidelity, division of marital assets, and David's full custody of the children, with visitation rights for her, along with a lemony of $1,500 monthly for three years. She dropped them onto the counter realizing finally, oh my God, what have I done? The lies and deceit she had spun for David over the past two years were now haunting her. She could no longer deceive herself into believing she had triumphed, that she could act as she pleased without David's objection, or that she could engage in relationships with other men without his input. Carol immediately dialed David's cell phone, but it went to voicemail. She left a brief message asking him to call her regarding some important paperwork she had received. Then she tried calling her former home, but there was no answer. Realizing she needed to act to salvage her marriage, she grabbed her car keys and purse and headed out, arriving home. She discovered her key no longer worked in any of the locks and the garage code had been changed. In full damage control mode, Carol drove to David's office. His assistant, who knew about Carol's affair, informed her that he was out for the day, unable to reach him there. She returned to her old house intending to wait for David and the kids to return from school. The children arrived around 4.30pm with their after-school sitter.
They greeted Carol with coldness, and her eldest refused to acknowledge her presence beyond a curt inquiry. What are you doing here? Carol sat in the dining room while the kids had a snack and started on their homework. She observed changes in the decor since her last visit. New items on the walls, different curtains, and a few pieces of new furniture. Around 5.20, David arrived home. Carol quickly approached him as he entered through the back door. David, honey, I'm home. I'm glad you're here. We need to discuss some papers that were delivered to me today. Great, Carol. Did you sign them and bring them along? I signed them before my lawyer sent them to you. I believe what I'm proposing is fair and aligns with family and divorce laws in the state. The kids, David, remain with me. That's not up for negotiation. However, you can have visitation rights if you'd like, and if they're willing to see you. Sweetheart, I'm planning to return home tonight. I've realized that I need you and the kids back in my life. I made a mistake thinking I needed someone else. You and the kids are all I need. I understand that now. I'm coming back, and I'll strive to be a good wife and mother, Carol pleaded. Not so fast, Carol. When you chose to leave us for Gordon, that was your decision. I remember trying to convince you otherwise, but you were firm about your choice. Well, you made it, and now you have to face the consequences. So no, you're not welcome back. Your home is with Gordon. You don't belong here anymore. It's been a year since you left, I explained firmly. Carol was softly crying now, and I handed her some tissues to wipe her tears. I waited a few minutes for her to regain her composure. I think it's time for you to leave. Can I spend some time with the kids, please? Sure, I'll go get them, I replied. I went upstairs to fetch the kids and inform them that their mother was downstairs and wanted to see them. They were hesitant at first, but after some persuasion from me and reassurance that they didn't have to talk to her if they didn't want to, they slowly followed me down to the kitchen. It had been months since they had last seen their mother. Carol smiled at them and said, Hi kids, I need a hug from you. They all stood still and didn't make a move towards their mother. Obviously the oldest asked her, Why did you leave us long? Carol started crying again. I'm coming home kids, I've missed you all so much. I love you all so much. My daughter counted fast. If you love us so much, why did you leave us and stay away for so long? Carol's expression shifted from shock to realization as the weight of her decisions sank in. It was clear she hadn't fully considered the consequences of her actions until this moment. I intervened, sensing the need for a private conversation. Kids, why don't you head back upstairs? Your mom and I need to have a private conversation right now, I said, gesturing for them to leave the kitchen. With disapproving looks, the children complied, led by Elvis. After a brief pause, I began, so do you still think leaving us for Gordon was a good decision? Did you honestly think you could just leave and return like nothing changed? I waited for her response, but all I heard were her sniffles and nose blowing. I've moved forward. In case you missed that, I continued, frustration evident in my voice. I suppose you only realized it when you got those divorce papers. Today, you rush over here once you saw your family had enough of your nonsense, still met with silence and sniffles. So gather up whatever belongings you haven't taken yet. I've packed what I could find into boxes in the garage. It should be manageable for you, or you can have Gordon assist you. If there's anything else you want from here, just let me know. You can take whatever you want, except me and the kids, I stated firmly. After waiting another minute for Carol's response, which didn't come, I spoke up again. I believe it's time for you to leave. There's nothing more to discuss. I'm not interested in having you back. The kids aren't eager for your return either. It's best you go back to Gordon. If you'd like, you can have your lawyer review the divorce papers, and we can let them handle the finer points. I suggested, standing up and walking towards the front door. I have opened it, signaling for Carol to leave. Goodbye, Carol, I said softly. She sat there for a moment, looking defeated, before finally standing up, grabbing her bag and walking out the front door. I shut the door behind her and took a deep breath, feeling a sense of relief wash over me. 
Four months later, my lawyer arranged a final meeting for us to sign the divorce papers. During the meeting, we negotiated the terms of visitation with the kids, agreeing that they shouldn't be compelled to see their mother if they didn't want to. Initially, their visits would be supervised by grandparents, with the possibility of unsupervised visits later if things went smoothly. Ultimately, it was up to the kids whether they wanted to see their mother. Surprisingly, they did have a couple of visits, but after meeting Gordon, they felt uncomfortable and chose not to return. It seemed they had a good instinct for character judgment. Meanwhile, my relationship with Shanna evolved as we spent more time together, meeting up two or three times a week. I proposed that we engage in activities beyond just physical intimacy, suggesting outings with our kids. Our daughters were similar in age to my youngest children, so I was eager for them to meet. Our first outing to the zoo, followed by pizza, went well. The kids got along splendidly. This marked the transition in my relationship with Shanna from casual to more serious dating. But one year later, quite some time has passed, and numerous changes have occurred in my life. I'm a year older and have gained wisdom from my experiences. Nowadays, Shanna and I reside together, along with our seven combined children. Managing a household with five kids is undoubtedly challenging, despite any misconceptions people may have. Fortunately, we all comfortably fit into my house, and with two of the girls sharing a room, we manage just fine. Over time, we formed a tight-knit family unit. Shanna and I decided to tie the knot shortly after bending our families. Our wedding was an intimate affair, held on a beach in the Dominican Republic, officiated by a judge friend, and attended by close family and friends. It was a truly memorable experience. To keep our relationship strong, we prioritize having a date night every week, where we focus solely on each other and enjoy a fulfilling intimate life. Additionally, we emphasize open communication, agreeing that it's crucial no matter the topic. One evening during dinner, the kids expressed their interest in trying camping. Excited by the idea, we gathered camping equipment and headed to a state park. The experience turned out to be fantastic, and the kids had an absolute blast. They especially loved gathering around the campfire and roasting marshmallows. There were a few mishaps with the marshmallows catching fire, resulting in some comical moments of dodging flaming gooey messes. The laughter and giggles from our four girls and one boy filled the air, making the experience even more enjoyable. As our family continued to grow, I made the decision to formally adopt Shanna's two girls. It was important to us that everyone in our household shared the same last name, simplifying things for our family unit. During our regular date night about a month ago, Shanna surprised me once again with her incredible news. As we dined, I noticed she chose water instead of her usual glass of wine. While that alone wasn't unusual, when she pulled a small white plastic stick from her clutch purse, I instantly understood the situation. She smiled as she handed it to me, and with a glance, I realized she was pregnant. Wow, my wife, who I've been married to for less than a year, and with whom I already share five children, is expecting another baby. We were both thrilled, albeit a bit surprised, to be preparing for the arrival of a new addition to our family. However, the biggest shock came when we learned that Shannon was expecting twins. Now, we're going to have seven children in total. Thankfully, I recently received a promotion at work, and I now oversee the legal division of the company. With my increased salary and bonuses, we'll be able to manage the financial responsibilities of a larger family and even save up for their education. To provide our growing family with a summer getaway, we purchased a cottage by a lake, about a three-hour drive from our home. We've already begun renovating and expanding it to accommodate our active and growing brood. Reflecting on the past, I realize how fortunate I am. Despite the challenges of a failed marriage, I found myself starting anew within just 2.5 years. What initially seemed like a tough period for me and my children, when Carol left us for someone else, turned out to be a blessing in disguise when I met a wonderful woman, Shanna, who embraced me and my kids with love amid the organized chaos of a large family. I'm immensely grateful for the luck I had in meeting Shanna and her daughters. Now, with two more children added to our family, we feel complete. Our children get along well, and we've become a happy, bended family. Moreover, 
My wife is stunningly beautiful, making our life together even more fulfilling. As for Carol, her life took its own course. A relationship with Gordon didn't last long after our divorce. It seemed that Gordon had a habit of pursuing married women, and soon enough, he left Carol for another. She continued her career as a book editor and moved into a one-bedroom apartment where she could work comfortably. I've heard she's been dating, but beyond that, I'm not aware of her life. Once, while Shanna and I were out with the kids, I thought I spotted Carol downtown. We walked as a group, with the older kids holding the hands of the younger ones. We didn't stop to chat with her, but I sensed she watched us pass by. Perhaps she reflected on how things could have been different, or maybe she felt relieved not to be responsible for children and husband anymore. Personally, I'm happy that everything worked out the way it did, well, and the problems of the ex-wife is the result of her choice. Thanks for listening to my story, post a comment and watch other videos.